The Dark Energy Survey has surveyed dark energy and found that our universe is unlikely to rip into pieces. I think that's good news. Let's have a look. Dark energy is the name that astrophysicists have given to a hypothetical ingredient of the universe that makes the expansion of the universe faster. So it's not that dark energy causes the expansion itself, it makes it faster. Dark energy should not be confused with dark matter, which does contribute to the expansion of the universe but doesn't make it faster. Dark energy isn't like anything we know. I'm not sure exactly why this stuff is even called dark energy, seeing that it's transparent rather than dark and isn't even energy. But well, it's certainly a catchy name. Dark energy is what determines the ultimate fate of our universe, how it'll end. Will the expansion get faster and faster? Will it slow down? Is maybe even a recollapse and a new beginning possible? It all depends on this mysterious stuff, dark energy. In astrophysics, the name dark energy isn't used for just one thing. It's a term that encompasses all kinds of different things which could cause this accelerated expansion. <laughs> one of these types of dark energy is the cosmological constant, usually denoted with a capital lambda. So the cosmological constant relates to dark energy like a banana relates to fruits. It's one of many. The cosmological constant is, would you have guessed it, constant, and it's the simplest type of dark energy. But like there are other fruits besides bananas, there are other types of dark energy besides the cosmological constant. Astrophysicists characterize all stuff that fills the universe by the ratio of its pressure over its energy density. This gives a quantity that's abbreviated with a W. Particles that move around fairly slowly, like you and I, for example, have zero pressure and zero W. That's astrophysics for you. If you look at your calendar to Tomorrow, I think you should keep in mind that you have zero pressure. Dark energy in general has the odd property that while it has positive energy density, it has negative pressure. For the cosmological constant in particular, the pressure is the same as the energy density, but with the opposite sign. So you have W equals minus one. And this brings me to the new data from the dark energy survey. They measured this W by looking at light from distant supernovae. The survey was conducted with a camera mounted on the Victor Blanco telescope in Chile that collects data in five different wavelength ranges. It closely monitored about one-eighth of the total sky for a total of more than 500 nights in the years from 2013 to 2019. In the past few years, the collaboration have analyzed the data and are now publishing the results. In the new paper, they report that they found 1,635 new supernovae of type 1A. These supernovae have a well-understood light emission that follows a common pattern. They are what astronomers call standard candles. Astrophysicists believe these supernovae happen when a white dwarf eats up a nearby star, gets too much and explodes. Who doesn't know the problem? If one measures both the brightness of the supernovae and the frequency of their light, one can tell how fast the supernova at a certain distance is receding from us. This way, one can use them to infer whether the expansion of the universe is getting faster or not. So this tells us something about dark energy. It's the same idea that the 2011 Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded for. That was the first evidence for dark energy. In the new data analysis, they now found that the best fit value for W is minus 0.8 and the 95% confident band is within plus 0.14 and minus 0.16 around the best fit value. Now remember that the simplest type of dark energy is the cosmological constant, which has W equals minus 1. So that's just barely outside the 95% confidence band of the best fit value. It's a very mild tension, kind of interesting, but too insubstantial to think much about it. More interesting is that it tilts the balance against W being smaller than even minus one. This matters because the value of W determines the ultimate fate of the universe. With W at minus one or larger, the universe will expand faster and faster and get darker and darker and colder and colder in a rather 
rather boring way that's sometimes called the big freeze. It might also recollapse, which is called the big crunch. But if W was smaller, so more negative than minus one, it would be much more dramatic. It's called the big rip. If that happened, eventually everything in the universe would move apart from each other at almost the speed of light. And this means that no forces could hold anything together, not even elementary particles. The new result from the Dark Energy Survey therefore means that a big rip is unlikely to happen, luckily. I find it kind of hard to understand what a big rip would even mean, but I'm pretty sure I don't want to be around when it happens. What do you think, Albert? A Chinese company has announced they're planning to mass produce tiny nuclear batteries that can last up to 50 years, possibly beating both a British and an American company who've tried to put those on the market for several years. What does this mean? Will we soon all power our phones with nuclear power? Let's have a look. We tend to think of radioactive material primarily as dangerous, and that's for good reasons, but that it's radiating also means that it's emitting energy. Radioactive materials therefore make for great batteries. If you use a material with a long half-life, nuclear batteries could last thousands of years without having to recharge. The idea isn't new, especially for medical devices where battery replacements are a health hazard. Already in the 1970s, pacemakers were equipped with plutonium-powered batteries. Some of them still run today. Newer devices use lithium batteries that have to be replaced once in a decade or so. But nuclear power is currently enjoying a strong comeback as an environmentally friendly source of energy. A few companies are producing nuclear batteries powered by tritium decay, but at the moment they're used primarily for scientific or medical purposes rather than for the consumer market. It's because they produce very little power in the range of nanowatts or microwatts. Just for comparison, your phone needs a few watts at least. So these batteries are not replacements for the batteries that you're used to. They're good to deliver low power, but for very long time. There's a market for this, but it's a small one. In the past years, we have repeatedly seen headlines about startups who want to bring more and bigger nuclear batteries on the market. Notably, there's the British company Arkenlight, formed by researchers at the University of Bristol. They said they wanted to bring small nuclear batteries on the market by 2024 using carbon-14 in the range of up to 200 microwatts. That's on the high end of nuclear batteries, but still very little compared to what most devices need. Their website seems to have gone missing last year. Then there's the American company Nano Diamond Batteries that made a lot of headlines a few years ago by claiming they can produce batteries that last more than 20,000 years from nuclear waste. A few months ago, charges of fraud were raised against them. The claim is that the company deceived investors by pretending to have tested technology that didn't exist. So, the half-life of that company was somewhat shorter than expected. But just exactly what technology are these companies working on? Batteries powered by nuclear decay come in two different types. The one is to use a radioactive substance to generate heat and then use the difference in temperature between two places to generate a current. This is known as a radioisotope thermoelectric generator. The technology for this was first developed in the 1950s and 60s by the air forces in the United States and the former Soviet Union. Back then, they were looking for a reliable and long-lasting power source for space missions, particularly those exploring environments where solar power isn't available. At least that's what they said was the reason they were developing these things. Pretty sure they came in handy for other purposes too. Would you like a nuclear battery with your summon? Whatever the motivation to develop nuclear batteries, they've since been used in many space missions. Also, the European Space Agency has recently given up its opposition to using nuclear batteries. This is probably in no small part because of what happened with the Philae probe that landed on a comet in 2014 as part of the Rosetta mission. It had a rough touchdown, hopped a few times and landed in the shadow. After three days, its batteries, which were supposed to recharge and solar 
solar power died. And that was the premature end of a very expensive mission. ESA is now planning to use a nuclear-powered spacecraft for its Argonaut moon lander scheduled to launch in the early 2030s. But while the technology for these radioisotope thermoelectric generators is well understood, they tend to be quite big. Also, the detour through a temperature gradient is rather inefficient if what you want to do is to generate electricity. If electricity is what you want, a better solution is to use semiconductors in which the generation of electricity is driven by nuclear decay. The new battery put forward by the Chinese company is of that type, and so are the ones by the British and American companies. These types of batteries are called alpha voltaic, beta voltaic or gamma voltaic batteries, depending on whether they use radioactive alpha, beta or gamma decay. Just as a quick reminder, alpha decay means that a large nucleus spits out chunks with two neutrons and protons, which are helium nuclei. Beta decay means the nucleus spits out electrons and gamma decay means that the nucleus spits out photons. The Chinese company uses beta decay and calls itself beta volt after that. They use nickel 63, which has a half-life of roughly 100 years and layer it between diamond semiconductors with a PN junction. This sounds kind of technical and I guess it is, but maybe it helps to know that this semiconductor stuff is the same type of material that's normally used in solar cells. In the solar cells, it's in falling light that creates a current. For the nuclear battery, it's not in falling light, but the electrons emitted in the beta decay that create the current. The company Better Volt won third prize for the battery in a recent innovation competition by the China National Nuclear Cooperation. The technology itself isn't new, but the push to the consumer market is. The company's first product is called the BV100 battery. It has a power of 100 microwatts and a voltage of 3 volts. It has about the same size as a typical cell battery. The power is somewhat lower than what the British companies aim at, but the voltage they quote is somewhat higher. So the Chinese battery looks plausible enough, but like the other nuclear batteries, it's probably going to remain a niche technology for low power devices that need to last a long time. It's a shame because if you had a phone battery that lasted 20,000 years, you could watch all my videos in one go. Floods, droughts, heat waves, hurricanes, storm surges. Extreme weather events receive a lot of media coverage. In recent years, these events have frequently been attributed to climate change. This extreme event attribution, as it's called, is a way to quantify how climate change supposedly increased the likelihood of a specific weather event by so and so much. But it's becoming increasingly clear that these numbers are underestimates. Yep, that's right. Reality is worse than they told us it would be. The idea of event attribution was first put forward by Miles Allen in the Nature Commentary in 2003. Allen, a professor at the University of Oxford, was trying to figure out whether he might one day be able to sue the fossil fuel industry because his street was flooded. But well, Oxford was underwater again last week and so far no one's figured out how to sue Shell for it. Allen's idea didn't take off until his student, Frederike Otto, now a professor herself, got on the topic. That's the same Alan, by the way, who wasn't happy about a quote from Otto in The Guardian, which I talked about a few weeks ago, but uh, better we stick with the science. Otto, together with Gerd Jan van Odenburg, who has since passed away, understood that the numbers for event attribution might not be of much use in lawsuits, but they're gold for newspapers. If you can say that climate change made this flood or that heat dome twice as likely, then that's much more tangible than talking about the consequences of a 0.1 degree increase of global average temperatures and I don't want to shout but while we were talking I saw you nodding out. The idea of event attribution is simple enough. You specify what type of extreme event you're interested in, say a flood above a certain amount of rainfall in some region of the planet, then you take a climate model and make two predictions for the frequency of that extreme event. One with the greenhouse gases at the current 
current level, one with pre-industrial levels. Then you compare the two cases. Even leaving aside the issue of people nodding out, this idea still has multiple problems which I talked about extensively in an earlier episode. One is that the frequency by which the event occurs in the model depends strongly on the exact definition of the event. The more details you add, the less likely the event is going to appear in any of your simulations, so you'll end up comparing zero to zero, which tells you zero. Since the definition is up to you, you can fumble with it until you like the result, which, just so we're on the same page, isn't how science should work. But the much bigger problem is that climate models were not coded to simulate extreme weather events and they're in fact not any good at it. Most climate models underestimate both the frequency and severity of extreme weather events. You don't have to take my word for this. If you look at papers on the topic of event attribution, you can find this information there in clear words. For example, in this review from 2021, you can read, climate models have not been designed to represent extremes well, and trends can differ widely between different climate models, and the results of the attribution study can depend strongly on the quantitative definition of the event. It's just one of those things so they don't tell you in the news articles. What this all means is that all those numbers which you come across in the headlines are likely to be underestimates. The new paper which just appeared confirmed this problem for extreme rainfall events. They looked at a set of 21 of the best climate models and compared the model's predictions with the actually observed changes. They find that, quote, virtually all climate models significantly underestimate the rates at which increases in precipitation extremes have scaled with global temperatures historically. I find the entire idea of extreme event attribution extremely problematic because it's it suggests a false sense of accuracy. If you tell policymakers that this recent once in a century flood has become twice as likely, they'll think they have 50 years until the next one hits them. But this is not what the numbers mean. They mean the event has become at least twice as likely. Maybe it now happens every year or twice a year. Basically, I think this entire event attribution business should be regarded with great scepticism. But while it might be difficult to attribute extreme events to climate change, it's much easier to attribute the popularity of the attribution to climate change, which is why I herewith want to propose the new research area of attribution attribution. You heard it here first. We've talked a lot about particle accelerators that look for new physics, but sometimes you can teach new tricks to old physics. A great example of this is flash proton therapy for cancer treatment that's just out of the laboratory and now being tested on patients in the first trials. Let's have a look. Flash. First things first, what does particle physics have to do with cancer? Well, one of the most common ways to treat cancer is radiation therapy with x-rays. So that's particles of light, the photons, with very high energy each. You can use these highly energetic photons to kill off cancer cells. The difficulty really isn't killing the cancer cells, it's killing the cancer cells without killing the patient. But the problem with using x-rays is that you can't shoot them at tumors inside the body without also burning some of the tissue on the way to the tumor and behind it. This is because the x-ray beam deposits its energy gradually in the tissue, sometimes too early and sometimes too late. One can somewhat alleviate this issue by rotating the beam around so that it overlaps most in the cancer region, but the problem that energy gets deposited where it shouldn't go is unavoidable. This can damage healthy cells and brings the risk of secondary cancers from the radiation treatment. That's if you use x-rays. But you can use beams of other particles instead, and this is where particle physics enters the chat. Because with heavier particles, you get a more targeted energy delivery. It's a case where a graph says more than a thousand words, so let me draw one for you. 
on the vertical axis, you have a measure for the energy that's deposited into the tissue that's called the dose. On the horizontal axis, you have the length of the path in the tissue. For x-rays, the curve looks somewhat like this. It does have a peak where the beam deposits most of the energy, but it'll dump a significant amount over a pretty big stretch of distance. That's the problem which damages healthy tissue. But if you instead take a beam of protons, the energy deposit in the tissue looks like this. A proton, just to remind you, is the nucleus of a hydrogen atom and is what the Large Hadron Collider collides. You see that a beam of protons is far less likely to interact with tissue on short distances than the energy deposit peaks rather suddenly and tapers off quickly. The peak in this curve is called the Bragg Peak. It's named after the father and son duo Sir William Henry Bragg and Sir William Lawrence Bragg, who were British physicists. They were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1915 for work related to this peak. I guess that was the Bragg Peak of their career. What's going on with this Bragg Peak is that the protons slow down as they lose energy, whereas light doesn't. So you see, the heavier particles bump into one atom in the tissue and lose a little energy there. Then the distance they cover until they hit the next atom is shorter because they're slower and then it gets even shorter until they've dumped all their energy. What happens with the protons in the end? They usually get absorbed by some nuclei. Isn't that kind of bad? Yes, it's kind of bad, but remember, you're doing this to destroy the tumor cells. It's supposed to be bad, just that it should be bad in the right place. The relevant thing is that what's left behind is mostly benign biological trash that the body can dispose of. Interestingly, if you take even heavier particles, the Bragg peak gets even more pronounced at a very specific distance. You could use, for example, nuclei of carbon atoms. You see how cool this is? You can basically use these beams to shoot at the tumor inside the body without roasting the tissue on the way there. The idea isn't new. For example, at the GSI in Germany, they ran a trial for using beams of carbon ions to treat cancer already in 1997. Mostly that's brain tumors where you want to make extra sure you don't damage surrounding tissue. This sounds great, so why isn't this done more often? The issue is that the bigger the particle, the bigger the accelerator you need to get them up to speed and the more expensive and difficult the entire procedure becomes. This is why proton therapy is still rather uncommon and that with heavy ions even less common. But particle accelerators are getting more efficient and smaller and also more affordable and that's why proton therapy is now being offered in more places. For example, the company Varian Medical Systems offers a proton beam machine for medical purposes at $20 million a pop. At Ohio State University, they just recently acquired a machine of the same type and last week they announced that they'll be testing a new treatment procedure called flash proton therapy. The idea of flash proton therapy is that rather than irradiating the tumor continuously for a few minutes, the same total dose is delivered packed into pulses lasting only a second or so. So the flashes. Dr. Doctors have known for some time that this seems to work better in that it delivers the damage more precisely to the tumor region, but they don't really understand why and the treatment method has only been out of the lab for a few years. There's a surprising amount of physics in medical treatments and personally I find this flash proton procedure one of the best examples. I've lost relatives to cancer and shooting the enemy with particle beams is just how I like it.